still remember years ago getting a book in the mail and looking at a book with this really learned cover called Guilty Pleasures of Unkind. It took me a few months to realize I'd read this other book called Nights Here, which I'd really liked. But of course, I still haven't gotten a sequel to that for all the reasons you already know. But I remember taking home Guilty Pleasures and I think spending the whole rest of my night finishing the book and deciding that I would never walk around with shirts with French lace cuffs on. And I hated, <laughs> and I hated Jean-Claude anyway. But... <laughs> yes, I know. I, okay, I, I'll take him over the, the uh, Passive Werewolf, but we won't go into that. <laughs> then along the way came Mary Gentry. It's nice to have an author who you like one character in one world. It's, it's a rare thing to have an author who you like two characters in two different worlds. And we got to discover a whole new look at Faye and fertility goddesses and ways to flood hotels. <laughs> and I don't want to say too much about a shiver of light except that, as usual, Mary is having some problems and now she's going to have triplets. And I'm pretty sure everyone she knows is going to claim, but I was the dad of that one. <laughs> And she's here to talk about that. Please welcome Laurel K. Hamilton. Thank you for that great introduction. Wow, nice microphone. Okay, um, we're being filmed, and I'm on mic. But my little jacket keeps brushing the mic. So I have to take the jacket off. I somehow didn't think you'd be too upset. And this is my, my PA and, and uh, right hand person. So hold while I strip off. video when I dressed tonight. I wasn't sure I was taking the jacket off, but I guess I am. But my rule is, if you're going to wear it, freaking wear it. The rule is, if you can't take the attention, don't wear it. I'm going to stamp the card of every man that has ever been on the receiving end of a woman dressed scantily who got mad at them because they couldn't take their eyes off their breasts or whatever was showing. I'm sorry, they're, sh they're men. And if they're heterosexual men, or even actually have friends that are gay saying that breasts are lovely. Uh, if you're gonna dress that way, you can't punish the men for being men. Looking's okay, that's it just so we don't get all carried away. Um, but I uh, have had been at a party where a woman was wearing a corset. She was beautiful. Corset. Great, great tracks of land. <laughs> because her waist was all cinched up and the breasts were up to here and she looked gorgeous. And uh, a, young, a young guy who was there at the party, he comes into the kitchen and he looks shaken. And he's 6'2", and he's cute. And he looks like, you know, he's seen a ghost or been slapped really hard by one. And I said, what's wrong? And he's leaning over like this, like he's almost in pain, and he says, oh God, I don't mean to be staring at your breasts. Because I was dressed not quite as, as uh, buxom as she was, but I was dressed nicely, and got it, got it, tracks of land were wandering around in there. And I said, if I didn't want you to look at my breasts, I would wear something else. And he went, really? And I went, yeah, I'm okay with it. If you're talking to me, I'd like eye contact, but glancing down is fine. And he went, really? And I said, yes, really. And then I got the story that the woman who'd been pissy to other people he just said, you look lovely, 
that corset makes your breasts look absolutely beautiful, is what he said to her. She cut him a new one. She yelled at him up and down and sideways. Other people witnessed it. I got reports that he was accurate in his reporting. Freaking don't wear the corset. Do or do not. There is no in between on this one. So, so I made a friend because I was okay with it. And then, one of my favorite parts of the evening of that party was that she was then bemoaning that she was old. She was old. And she was beyond her time. And she was very whiny about it. And I said, oh and dear, how old are you? She offered, I asked. She said, well, I just turned 30. <laughs> I was over a decade older than she was. And I just went, you know, 30 was a good decade for me. She went, what? I said, 30 was a great decade. You'll love it. What? And then I explained I was over a decade older than she was. And she didn't believe me. Yes, that is nice. Yes, that's true. But it, it, it just always cracks me up when around people who have just turned 30 that have just, their life is over. 30 is a wonderful decade. 40 was great, too. All right. Now that for some reason I've gotten completely distracted by breasts and telling party stories, I think it's the dress. Um, it's great to be back in Seattle. It is almost always sunny when I come to Seattle. Portland, not so much. But I, apparently the sun likes me here. Um, so we'll just have to keep track of it. We got sun today, the next time I come, we'll just keep a little tick. And if I really do bring the sun, I don't know. Come more often, move here. I don't know, worship for the sun deity would work. <laughs> no, it's just really weird that everybody says there's no sun here. You couldn't prove it by me. All right, you finally have the new Mary book in hand. Yeah. Uh, five, years in five years of waiting. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but Mary wanted time to herself. And then she started talking to me again and stopped being mad at me. Or she just wanted to be left alone. Think about your favorite books if it was your life. Now, yes, the sex is great and, and the men are great if you have the time and communication skills for it all. But think about all the awful things that happen in the books that we love. If you were really in that book, wouldn't you want to flag it and go, dear, dear whoever's in charge of this? Give me a few years of break. She wanted a few years to enjoy things. So apparently she's doing things that aren't in the book and just had a little jump there. But uh, now here we are. We can do this one of two ways. I can continue to talk. I can talk for hours. Um, anyone who's been to an event can, can say yes, I can talk. Um, or we can go directly to questions and I can answer your questions. It's your time. I'm here. Talk. <laughs> Lazy buggers. <laughs> yes, I shouldn't give them a choice. You've ruined it for Chicago, you know. <laughs> the, there will be on the internet going, those blasted Seattleans. <laughs> oh, but, uh, Mary, this Mary book was hard. It was a hard one because uh, Mary's always harder. But a funny thing happened. I went back and reread the books to get ready to write this next book. And I didn't know. How many of you knew that the first seven books of the Mary series is an epic fantasy? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I, but when I'm re reading it, I go, you have? 
the lesser noble who is never going to come to the throne, has no magic, and nobody really thinks much of them. They do the best they can, and then suddenly they're in the running for the throne by some surprising event. And then people try to kill them, bad things happen, magic happens, they become more powerful, and it looks like they may get the throne, and then other complications ensue. And then finally you conquer the day, get whatever goal you're going for, ta-da! It's a freaking epic fantasy. Except with more, you know, it's kind of like Games of Thrones, except with, with more sex and less death. when I was writing it, that it was an epic fantasy, which I thought was very interesting. And then Divine Misdemeanors. It's a mystery, pure and simple. It's a mystery. And it's a fun book, but it was like, I did my epic fantasy, I've done a mystery, and then Mary said, I'm not a mystery series. And I, I said, well, then what are you? And she wasn't sure. So here we come to A Shiver of Light. How many of you read it already? Yeah, part way. Um, it is not a mystery. It is, I hope to God, it's not another epic fantasy. I don't know what we do for seven more books. Um, but it's Mary's story. It's the story she wanted told. And it's, it was one of the hardest books I've ever written because I didn't realize that I'm a mystery writer at heart. I use the mystery as the spine of the book that I'm writing. It helps me plot, it helps me pace, it helps me keep on target. This book is not that. That's why this book was so hard. I didn't realize I was a mystery writer at heart. Most of the books I've written are mysteries. And it was very interesting to find out after 30 some books that I'm a mystery writer at heart. I just happen to use magic and romance and any other genre I happen to be amused by in the mix. So everyone, well, a lot of you are gonna ask me questions about how to be a writer. I've written over 30 books. I didn't know I was a mystery writer. I wrote seven books of an epic fantasy and didn't know it was an epic fantasy. So it is a very mysterious thing that we do as writers. You sit in a room by yourself and you talk to your imaginary friends and under other circumstances, if they talk back to you, you'd be medicated and put somewhere. <laughs> and instead, it's somehow magically a job. Um, oh, and for, for anybody out there who thinks that that's not what I do, because I still get people thinking that I write more from real life, if I had that many gorgeous men romping through my room, how would I get anything done? I am I'm, I'm sorry, and, and you know, uh, the small dogs being walked by the B, person in full BDSM is amusing as a visual. I'll give you that one. But I just think my neighbors would protest. They'd likely call police. Alan Leather is walking, is out of your neighborhood. Who is he? Oh, it's that writer again. That's what my neighbors call me. I'm the writer. Because I don't socialize enough. And I'm always having a book come out. No, there are good sports about most of it. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I don't take dictation. I actually sit in a room by myself most of the time. Because if you don't, you don't write books. All right. I've let you dictate that I talk longer, but now I'm going to turn the tables and make you talk to me. I want you to ask questions. This is, ah, a hand, very quickly. I love it. How do you set boundaries between your writing and your life? When you find out, tell me. <laughs> One of the hardest things I've ever done and I still struggle for a balance is how to be as productive as I am. And if I don't write enough, I begin to have nightmares. I mean, I'm driven to write, but I have a, I have a daughter, I have a wonderful husband, who, Jonathan, who is not here because he had to have knee surgery. 
And so he got off crutches and everything in time to be able to drive while I was gone, but uh, he, he could not come out. And I am missing him terribly. I think it's the first time I've come out in quite a while without him. Um, but I have a husband I actually want to spend time with, a daughter that I actually like and want to spend time with. Um, I have family and friends beyond that that I want to spend time with. And um, I am also, uh, my husband and I, we're also dating two other people. We're polyamorous. Okay. How many of you don't know what polyamorous is? Everybody does. I love Seattle. I spend so much time explaining things in other places. So that's a lot of trying to socialize and see people um, and trying to write. So I don't know. I'm still struggling with that. Um, any of you that are trying to write with babies or very small children, uh, that was the hardest of all because small children just don't understand that mommy's in the middle of something. <laughs> and my daughter had impeccable timing. <laughs> Starting the sex scene, and then suddenly at the door, knock, 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 mommy. <laughs> and she would need something. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> I guess writing the sex scenes is just like real sex. Small children are interrupted. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, nothing kills the mood like the small kids at the door going, mommy. Yes, and that's why you have a lock on your door. <laughs> One of my goals in life was never to be walked in and on by our child. I have succeeded. <laughs> uh, but no, it's incredibly hard. I think all working mothers have that is a real problem. Our working parents, fathers too. I know a lot of fathers that are primary caregivers too. But writing, you're at your house. You never even leave this. Okay, I can cast them no children, right? Yeah. You never even leave the damn house. <laughs> and um, people think you're more available than you are. So it makes it doubly hard. So I don't know. I have no good answer. All right. Uh, yes. She noticed that Anita and Mary had body issues, and was this something I had? Yes, yes. Um, when I, the woman who raised me, my grandmother had many fine qualities. She taught me to be tough. She taught me to uh, fend for myself. She taught me that I didn't need a man to feel good about myself. But she had other issues. Um, my mother was the beautiful daughter, one of five, and she was the beautiful sister. And my grandmother believed that her beauty had attracted my father, which it had. And he was not the best person for her. They were, it didn't work out very well. So she decided she was not gonna make the same mistake twice. So when I got up into double digits, old enough for it to matter, she began to tell me that I was ugly. And that I was so ugly that I would never find a man that would have me so that I should get a job, get an education, because no one would ever take care of me, no one would want me. And she told me that regularly. She was the only family I had, really. So I believed her. And I still, part of me is still believing that. It stays with you what you're told as a child. And um, um, I've had people complain that Anita is either, they don't get it, they either, that Anita is not beautiful, so how does she get all these gorgeous men, or that she's being, uh, she's lying. She's telling people she doesn't look good, but she knows she does. No, actually, actually, some of us just grow up with issues where we can't see ourselves. You, you look in the mirror and you go, other people react to me a certain way, so I can go on that. But it took me years to realize that my grandmother probably should have had therapy on this issue. <laughs> um, she meant well. I, I have to just go with that. I'm just gonna go with that. So she meant well. She wanted to, to protect me from being a victim of, my, uh, of beauty. Because if beauty is the main thing you have, and I know other women that have been raised being told they're beautiful, 
actually, that can be very damaging if you think that's all you've got. You need to be more well-rounded. I, I would like it to be so that men can be beautiful and women can be strong and everybody can be smart or whatever they want to be. This emphasis that women are known for their beauty and men are known for their strength. Who made this rule? I think it sucks. So yes, the body issues and everything, but most women do not see themselves as totally beautiful. So I wanted my, my main characters. Anita, I didn't realize what I was doing because it was just how I kind of felt. With Mary, I did it on purpose because everyone has issues. And I wanted to show that everyone has issues. Even those of us who are, you know, Mary and, and Anita both have these beautiful men. Mary started off with beautiful men wanting to sleep with her and sweep her off her feet, but she didn't see that she was that beautiful. And I thought it was important to show that. Now, in real life, when my daughter was 18 months old, I vowed to never say another negative thing about myself in front of her. Because I was, we were on vacation, I was getting undressed and putting on some, something to go out for the evening, and I complained about my body in front of her. And then I watched my toddler go to the mirror and look at the exact same body part I had complained about. And I watched her eyes and I went, no, no, the buck stops here. And I never said another negative thing about myself in front of my daughter. <laughs> and I went beyond body issues. I literally never said another negative thing in front of my daughter. And I made sure that my, uh, that Jonathan, Jonathan is my second marriage, so not her biological father, but I made it a rule that we would be positive in front of our daughter. Period. Absolutely, period. <laughs> it was really hard. <laughs> because you don't know how negative you are till you start listening to yourself. And it wasn't just about body issues. It was, it was about a lot of things. And we began to have it, it was a zero tolerance policy. So by the time she was about eight, we were at the Renaissance Fair. We all liked the Renaissance Fair, and they had this thing where the kids went around and, and went on a quest, and you got the little stickers, and she was so excited, because then you got, you got to be knighted or be made a lady by the queen at the end of the day. She was so psyched. We were so hot and so tired and so wanted to go home before the end of the day when the queen would see you and see all the children. And we get there, and the line is and it's St. Louis in the summertime, which means it's humid and over 100 degrees. And we're going, oh, please, God, let us go home. Let her not be this excited about it. Oh, yes, she's just skipping around and going, look, the line's so short. <laughs> and we're almost there. And it'll be so good, and I'll be a lady, and I'll get to meet the queen. And she's just, she's just bubbling over. And she's kind of skipping around out of the energy. And I turn to John, and John looks at me. And, he's, and, I, and he says, if the glass, to us, the glass is broke, not, a, not just half empty, but it's broken. <laughs> it's dirty. And there's something floating in it. <laughs> she looks at the same glass, and it's bright. It's shiny. It's full of something awesome. And it will be even better when she gets to taste it. And we just... Look at what we have accomplished. She is still that bright and shiny. She, she's one of the most positive people I know. And it's just like, so how did we do this? We were always positive in front of her, no matter how grumpy we were inside. And she's a teenage girl that has no body issues. How's that? About, about two years ago, she said something, and I thought, I've, I've, I've dropped the ball. She says, you know, there's one thing I changed about my body, and I just, my stomach tightened, I went, oh God, what, what did I miss? And she says, I wish I had, I wish I had your booty. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I make my face back from, you know, the, the cringing that I was doing, so I, says, I, said, I said, excuse me, and she says, she says, I'll just never have, she says, she says, I've never had an ass as nice as yours, Mom. <laughs> Thank you.
because my daughter is built more like my ex-husband. She's very slender, very willowy, which I would never been. And so the one thing she doesn't have is, 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 is my sister says, the Spanish hips. And she wanted them. She didn't want to be smaller, she wanted to be bigger. And I just went, yes! <laughs> and since I came to this conclusion, you know, uh, over 18 years ago, never to be negative in front of her, studies have proven that that's where it starts. It starts with us, ladies. It starts with us, complaining about ourselves in front of our kids and our daughters and our nieces and our everybody. Stop it. Even if you believe it, even if you think you're, even if you think that negatively of yourself, stop doing it in front of the kids. Just stop. And every time you start to say something negative, turn it into something positive. After over a decade of doing it, Jonathan and I realized that we had become more positive people because we didn't allow ourselves to be negative in front of our daughter. Try it. It really does work if you police yourself hard enough. Eventually, you need to begin to like yourself better. So, there. My soapbox is, box is now complete for the moment. All right, I know we have more questions. I've just derailed this completely. When are we going to meet Anita's family and, you know, where her dad and her stepmother and, like, we've been talking about it for a couple years now. Are we getting close? Can, can everybody hear what she just asked? Okay. She's asking when we will see Anita's family, her dad and her stepmom and everybody, because I, I do have a book set, and I've said this before, we would go home for Thanksgiving with Anita. When I put this idea together, I thought Richard would be going with us. That boat has sailed. Um, so I think Mike and Nathaniel would go. I even wrote the beginning of the book. And it's a good beginning, it'll probably be the first chapter. It's not ready yet. I don't know why, but it's not. Sorry. We will eventually see that. I got tentative notes even for seeing the other side, her mother's side of the family. But that's even further down the road. So, there. Way in the back, green shirt. Out of all the books you've written, what would you say your Out of all the books I've written, what is my favorite? I couldn't possibly have just one. Um, I love Obsidian Butterfly because we finally get to see We finally get to see Edward's Bat Cave. It, it really was. I felt very much like Batman let us into the inner sanctum. That was really fun. Um, and I'd never been to New Mexico or Albuquerque, anywhere in there. And Edward insisted he was from New Mexico. And I said, you can't be from New Mexico. I've never been there. And he said, trust me. Oh, really? Yeah. Edward, yeah. Uh -uh. And in, in my head, he's even now going, I'm trustworthy <laughs> to the right people. Um, so it turned out that Nebulas, which is the uh, Science Fiction Writers of America annual uh, awards ceremony, was in Santa Fe that year. I get off the plane in Albuquerque, I look around those black mountains and I go, Damn it, you really are from here. <laughs> How a fictional character that I created could be from a place I've never seen or been, that's a riddle for a different day. Um, I loved Blue Moon because we finally crossed the barrier with Richard after seven books of foreplay. Um, I loved, uh, I don't know. I, I have so many books of, for Anita that I've loved or for different reasons. I've loved watching Jean-Claude grow and become more of a person rather than a plotter. Yeah. Um, Anita's worn him down from Machiavellian beauty to, to being real. And uh, in, fact, I, in fact, I was back at the hotel <laughs> working on the next book. And, and Jean-Claude actually, uh, actually Anita and Jean-Claude are talking about the fact that, that, uh, that when Richard proposed back in book four, 
Wasn't it Lunatic Cafe where he proposed and she briefly suggests? And then she panicked immediately? Everybody's caught up on Anita, right? Yes. Okay, it won't be a spoiler then, just check in. Um, but when he proposed in Affliction, it was a surprise to us. To me, too. And to him. Because if he, as he says, if I'd known you would say yes, I'd have made a big deal out of it. I'd, I'd, I'd have, he'd have made a production of it. No. So she didn't panic. She still isn't panicking. She still feels secure about it. And uh, they're discussing on how they've changed and how he says, you couldn't have married me, then no one could have. He says, I wasn't real enough. I didn't believe in anyone enough, not even myself. And yes, isn't it? Um, and timing is everything in relationships. So I look at the books and I go, okay, that's, I love the scene at the end of Narcissus and Chains where Anita gets away, where the bad guys don't capture her and she had, and the third of my book was thrown out. Literally, a third of my plot was thrown out. I had, they were supposed to be captured in that scene and she got away. My girl was too tough and she had too much help with her. So they got away. And then I called Jonathan, who I, I just started to date almost at the end of that book. And I, but we'd been friends for years before that. And I call him up and I go, oh my God, they ruined my plot. <laughs> the deadline's here and she, the third of my book is gone and I don't know what to do and I'm ranting on the phone. And he says, well, what about that thing that you, Anita learned to do in Obsidian Butterfly? Um, and he's, and I went, oh, that's really cool. I'd forgotten about that. Click. <laughs> Three hours later, having written through the next scene using his suggestion, I call him back up and go, did I hang up on you? <laughs> and he says, yes, but I understood why. It's one of the reasons I'm married to him and that we work so well because, yes. He doesn't get upset when I do those kinds of things, which I still do. Uh, but I, I loved affliction. I loved a shiver of light. Shiver of light was really a hard write, but I'm happy with the book and happy with the story continuing. And affliction, I got to see Micah's family. Um, that was really cool. And we got to go to Colorado, which which was beautiful. And. Uh, so it's hard to pick one favorite, but there's lots of favorites. And character growth arcs from book to book, that I like and enjoy. All right, other questions? Um, over here. Yes, you. You talked on your blog about like three days of quilting after you wrote the scene in Shimmer. If you do a spoiler. Okay, I can't say anything, you know that, right? I wasn't either. Okay. No spoilers. Seriously, guys, no spoilers. Uh, black t shirt. Yes. Hang on, a little, little louder, please. Oh, I don't think of him as the bad kitty. She asked if I was going to do a book that focuses more on Nathaniel's, uh, Nathaniel, and, and she said, the bad kitty, that I'm going, who the hell's the bad kitty? <laughs> He's a very good kitty. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yes, Jean Claude hasn't done that often, has he? Because he's not a bad kitty. He's the person who organizes their entire domestic life. He's a useful kitty. Um. Yes. Actually, I made notes about going. There is no statute of limitation on murder. And he saw his stepbrother beaten to death. There is no statute of limitations on it. 
So I've made notes that we would go back and try to find his stepfather and see if we can figure out what, where, the, where his brother is, where the body went, and get somebody in jail or something. Right now, though, we're in the midst of trying to decide how a wedding is going to work with this many people. <laughs> Legally, of course, you can't. Legally, of course, you can only marry Jean Claude. But do we have one big wedding with them? Or do we have a commitment ceremony with a lot of people? Or do we have one big wedding and then we have a commitment ceremony with everybody else? Instead of Utah. <laughs> Once that one, that's illegal even in Utah. <laughs> Two, it's always women. It's always women with one men, which biologically speaking makes no sense. It doesn't. I'm sorry. More, more women to men. I don't know. Some men perhaps may be up to it. But it's going to be a challenging task. And how many men, and really, really, I, I haven't watched the show with the extra wives, but I just know that the man just leaves the emotional caretaking to the women. I'm leaving now, you fight amongst yourselves. I don't. <laughs> because that's what that's the way it happens. A lot of times the women end up being emotional caretakers. Um, but no, Utah won't work. They do poly polygamy, they did at one time, not polyandry. Polyandry is more men and one woman. I don't know if there's a word for like a couple of women and more men. Would it still be polyandry? No, like a party. Sounds like a party. <laughs> Uh, real, real life polyamory, polyamory is all about the negotiations and talking, 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 talking about everything. Because you don't just have to get one opinion or two opinions, you have to get a group opinion. I now know that one of the biggest fictions I write is that Anita could date this many people <laughs> and everybody would be okay with it. No way. No way, you can't date this many people. You might be able to sleep with this many people if they are willing to share and like have a plan, a schedule or something. But you can't emotionally caretake for this many people. And it's, it's certainly tiring to need it out, just taking care of everybody. Um, so, I totally lost track. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we had two people say two different things. Nathaniel, we are going back to see his family. And, uh, well, really, we're not sure how much family's left. But go back to see if we can... He was so young when it happened, it's going to be really hard for him to be an acceptable witness in court. But there is no statute of limitations on it, so we could indeed make his stepfather's life very difficult. And that might be satisfying in itself. Um, hmm, I have to be quiet now, because that's a spoiler. Okay, way in the back in the yellow shirt. Yes. Um, how did you feel about Olaf and the Marilyn? How did I feel about uh, Olaf becoming, uh, you know, contaminated with with uh, lycanthropy? Like he wasn't dangerous enough? <laughs> I'm sorry. Of all the people to get changed into anything, he was not my choice. Um, we will be seeing him again. I even have, I think I have the title, but I have no plot yet, other than the overarching plot of the fact that eventually he's not gonna make it out of another book. He can't. Um, I, and, and all of you people that think that Anita and he should hook up. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. Let's just, one more time. No. No. Um, the, though I couldn't, shouldn't be surprised since real serial killers actually get love letters and offers of marriage in jail after being convicted of real serial killer killings. But it really did surprise me how many people like, really like, Olaf. Some bad boys cannot be fixed. Women want to do the bad boy thing and fix them. Men want to be white knights. Both are doomed to failure is relationship strategies. Just so I thought I'd add that part. 
you can't save everybody, and you can't fix people who don't want to be fixed. So, all right, other questions? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> sunglasses? Sunglasses, yes. I, I see. Yes. I'm going, uh, I'm trying to decide on clothing. I should, I'm, I'm really bad at that. So, green shirt? Green, green, green shirt? Pink shirt? You're wearing two shirts? So, sunglasses. There you go. Um, can you explain the mechanics of why you can't excise Asher's scar? Because it's not as simple. I am not sure why we, why why to do it? Well, it's his big stumbling block. He used medicine. Oh, please. Asher had these issues before that. <laughs> he uses the scar. Did everybody hear in the back? Why Anita can't cure Asher of his scars? One, we're not sure it would work. I'm not saying she has to do it, but some of them. Maybe John wanted them, but I don't know. No. I, I don't think so. I don't think anybody else has been set up with any kind of related power to it. Yes, okay, we cut off part of the scarring and then hope we can heal it. What if we can't? Do you want a piece of you cut off just to see if we can heal it? I don't think so. Um, but I have really struggled with the idea of, I think Asher's beautiful the way he is. We all do. Nobody else but Asher thinks that these are a fault. It's a bell, bell, uh, bell and she was crazy. She is crazy. Currently crazy, continuing to be crazy. Um, so, one of the interesting things I've discovered is that I don't see scars the way most people do. I didn't know this, but I don't. And, um, and so, he's beautiful now. So, do if we take his scars, and if we can do that, which we might be able to, does that imply our state? That he wasn't beautiful before with the scars, which is not true. I don't want to cure him and suddenly have him be flawless and, and make, make everything okay, because that won't make everything okay. Only good therapy will make everything okay. So I'm, I'm torn. I originally thought we would, but why? Why are we doing it? And I don't know. Until I can answer that question, I think, or until Asher comes to me and asks really, really hard about it, I think we'll put a we'll put a question mark by it. Because he's beautiful now. And he was an incredible bastard before he got the scars. I mean, I have more of his background than you guys do. Trust me on this one. He was one of those people that his beauty made him beyond arrogant. And um, but he hasn't really learned is everything. I don't know. I don't know. But I've been thinking about it. And I don't know if it would help him, if he would still feel beautiful, or he his insecurities go deeper than that. Mental mania. No. You know, when, no, I just don't see that happening. He's not that ambitious. Asher's. She said he'd get perfect, and then he would take on Jean Claude for the council. No, Asher's not that not that ambitious. He really isn't. It's one of his flaws as a master vampire. Okay, other questions? Um, yes. Um, we've heard about Edward, Olaf, and I was wondering if we're going to hear anything more about our uh, well hung Native American bounty hunter. <laughs> <laughs> you know the interesting thing? If you describe a woman, in that way, people would be upset. But you can describe a guy as the well-hung Native American guy, and everybody, everybody's fine with it. I've noticed this double, this double standard. Um, Bernardo, Spotted Horse. Uh, yes, we will be seeing Bernardo again. Uh, we'll be seeing him at the wedding when Edward finally ties the knot with Donna, and we'll also be seeing him when we ha finally have Olaf back on stage. I don't know in between that. I really don't. And, and let's get real. I write first person narration. We don't need more men. No more. No moss, I hope. Um, 
don't, well, we really need some more women. Because no one woman can date this many men, and the men are stubbornly not bisexual enough, so we need more men. I think they're holding out. Um, when I was writing Mary, I got like the second or third book, Jean-Claude actually came into my head while I'm writing Mary, and he said, you had this and did not offer me any. This was back when Anita was still fighting the good fight and not wanting to really give in to, to how she felt about him. And I apologized to my imaginary person from the other series going, I'm sorry, I didn't know she'd be this big a pain, and why am I apologizing to you? <laughs> because maybe I owed him one? I don't know. Um, but Bernardo will be back on, but I, I don't see a way for him to date Anita. So even if the, well, endowed Native American comes back on stage. He's just going to be kind of a, not a, a friend, work buddy. He's a work buddy. I, I don't know what to do with him other than that. He is gorgeous, but he, I don't know. I'd almost have to have another, no, I won't say it. Never mind. All right. Um, yellow shirt. Yes, you. Will Belmore and Anita get into it? Probably. I have no idea. I have no idea. I really expected Bill to show up by now. Or to do something where we'd have to kill her by now. I don't know what she's doing, which is making me a little nervous. Because every once in a while, I'll go sit down and I'll try to check on people that aren't on stage. And she's empty to me. She's not on stage for me. So she's off doing something I'm not going to be happy with. I'm pretty sure of that. Eventually, eventually, we shall see her. And probably, I don't know if she's going to adapt very well to being here in America. More women. <laughs> More women, not crazy psychotic bitches. <laughs> we need people that share wealth. She does not. Okay, other questions? Wolf shirt. What's the toughest internal price I pay for being consistently dedicated to my writing? I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Um, toughest internal price I pay. If I don't write enough, I have nightmares. If I write, I don't. Um, I make a fine living at a job that most people don't make a living at, so that's pretty cool. I get to play with my imaginary friends in a way that is like, I'm still seven and playing Let's Pretend We're Dragons for a day, and get paid for it. Um, I met my husband, is a, he, was a, he was at a signing as a fan. That's where we met. So, you know, I wouldn't have met my husband, who, who is wonderful. Um, I, I've met almost everybody in my life. Not everybody, but most people through my writing, so that's been wonderful. And Charles Price. Um, <sighs> I'd say the things I've played the biggest internal price for have nothing to do with the actual writing, but more perhaps why I write what I do. And those prices would have been paid regardless of what I did for a living. And um, good therapy is a wonderful thing. <laughs> All right. Um, purple, purple shirt with the over thing. I, 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 gray. I differentiated. You're not wearing a shawl or anything, or a jacket. Anita will not willingly get pregnant. <laughs> Let's just state that. If Nathaniel don't get, get pregnant, we can do it. <laughs> but I think a lot of women feel that way about the men in their lives. Um, Anita, one of the things I know I found when I was pregnant and had my daughter as a small baby was how helpless I was. Absolutely helpless. There comes a time late in pregnancy where you can't even see your freaking feet. You can't run. You can't even get behind the wheel of a damn car if you're big enough. So Anita would be absolutely helpless with all her enemies still out there. That sounds like a bad idea. 
Um, I don't know what, uh, would a baby just be a hostage? If you're carrying a baby, you have the baby in the little front carrier, you can't. You can put Kevlar on yourself. You can't put Kevlar on the baby because the baby will still be shattered and killed by the impact of the bullets. I don't know how to do a baby in a needs life. It'd be cute. Matthew's adorable. You know, we get to borrow a baby and send him back. Um, I don't know how it would work. I would love to have her pregnant because I can say everything I believe about pregnancy through Anita. Because I hated being pregnant. Hated it. Resented it. Wanted to be pregnant, did it on purpose. I just didn't realize how, well, unpleasant it all was. And I'm not talking labor. The whole process, I mean, it's like aliens in your body. You have this little person in there that's not you. It moves and you didn't move it. You didn't do anything and it's moving and it's inside you. Now some women love that. I thought it was creepy. <laughs> and, and there's nothing like watching, it's like a horror movie. You watch the little hand under your skin go around on your skin and you can see it. It's a whole person in there and it's not you. I love my daughter. And, uh, and, and and I'm very happy that I was a mother, but I am not one of those people that waxes great about it. I, I think it's one of the hardest things I've ever done and the most confusing because every time you figure them out, the little buggers get older and change. <laughs> and babies, I don't like babies because they can't talk to you. They can't tell you why they hurt, why they're crying, what's wrong. They are the most frustrating type of person imaginable. It's like being in a foreign land, and they can't talk to you. But you know they mean to talk to you about something that's important, and they can't say it. It was very frustrating. I was so happy when my daughter could talk and communicate. Um, so I would love to have Anita pregnant if we could do like a do-over at the end of the book. To have pregnant, have the baby, but if we do, do that, no, I'm not going to do the I don't know how many of you remember. I'm not going to do the step into the shower. It was all a dream last season from Dallas. I won't do that. Nathaniel wants a baby. I've said get a puppy. If you can't handle the puppy, no baby. That seems fair. All right. Other questions? Uh, gentlemen in the... Yes. Um, he's talking about the Book Talk Nation talk I gave, and I talked about how I world build. And I, I kill more pages for world building than any other writer I know. Most writers, I, I have to do hundreds and hundreds of pages of world building before I find my voice. I knew I did this. I knew I did this with Anita. I didn't remember how many pages I wrote until I went through every file box in my office after I wrote Sugar Life. And I found old versions of Anita. Before her last name was Blake, I found Larry Kirkland was in the first book. I found no Jean-Claude in the first book. I found, um, I found that there were no vampires. That I knew. There was only zombies. I found that Anita's voice was not solid. Hundreds of pages of wasted. But it wasn't wasted, not for me. Because that's how I found Anita's voice. That's how she stepped on the stage for me. And, but when I sat down to write Mary, I thought I could skip it. I'd written a lot of books by then. I knew how to do this. So I just jumped into the book. I wrote over 700 pages. My new editor took it, loved it, and I hated it. And I took it back. I've never done that before or since. I took it back and I said, no, it's not ready. Don't edit it yet. And then I gutted it. I took, I cut, I cut, it was 700 pages, I think, and I cut at least 70% of it and destroyed it. And because I hadn't found Meredith's voice. She, it really read like kind of Anita Light, or Anita Slightly, and it wasn't a new character. It wasn't a new world. It didn't breathe for me and live for me. And I rewrote it. And the first, that draft I turned into my editor was really my world building. And I just didn't know it. And when I sat down to do it, I finally had her voice. Mary was real, and she was a real character. So I now know I'm world building on other worlds now, new, new world building, and I now have 
I don't know, a couple hundred pages probably of the New World. And I suddenly, just the other day, sat down and realized I had the beginnings of a story in that world for the first time. And I had my main character for the first time. And it's something totally different from me. Um, I had another world where I thought I had the beginnings of a book and I realized that I didn't do the world building yet. So I have to do that, then I'll go back. And I think that is the beginning of the first book, but I haven't done my world building. I have to kill a lot of trees first. I actually am trying to edit on screen and save the trees now, but I still have to do hundreds of pages yet. And um, uh, one of them is going to have a male main character for me, which I've never done. I'm kind of a little nervous about it because it's, it's prompted me to start asking questions of my male friends and of my husband that most women don't think to ask. Because I finally realized I don't know how men go up and down such stairs without injuring themselves. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I was really thinking about it going, oh, how do you not get caught? <laughs> and I asked my husband, I said, okay, I know this sounds like a really stupid question, but if I'm going to write from a male protagonist's point of view, I need to know at least the basics of being a guy. And I never thought about how different that might be, just going up a set of stairs. And so he answered questions. He's used to that by now. And other male friends have answered questions. And it'll be interesting to see if I can get the guy viewpoint right. Because if I can't, I don't want to do it. If I can't do it well, I don't want to do it. And so I've now been indoctrinated into some of the inner workings of guidance. <laughs> And one of the interesting things is, you know how when you ask the guy in your life, what are you thinking? And he goes, nothing. And you go, no, really, what were you thinking? And he goes, nothing. And then so many women get mad at them, and then the guy has to make something up. Because guess what? He was thinking nothing. Guys have the ability to have the zen quiet in their head. They're thinking nothing. It's a flat line. <laughs> like white noise. <laughs> Women, on the other hand, are always thinking a bajillion, trillion, million things at once. <laughs> um, I have learned through knowing this, I have been practicing the guys in of thinking nothing. It is damn relaxing. <laughs> And a couple of days, because I started talking to John about it, makes him think too hard about it. And he had a day where he was thinking like a girl, and all these different things were in. By the end of the day, he said, no wonder women are mean. <laughs> he said, how do you survive thinking like this and not go crazy? I said, I am practicing the way of guys in. So I don't go crazy. But no, so I'm practicing, I'm doing my world building, and I have about three different worlds that I'm world building, and whoever gets done first will get the first story. And um, it's, it's very interesting understanding I must do this first. That's how I explore the world, that's how I get my character voice, that's how I do everything. I don't know any other writer that does it this way. Because that's the big thing about being a writer, everything's unique to you. And you need to find what works for you. Sadly, hundreds and hundreds of useless pages that don't really go anywhere are part of my process. As a, as a working writer, it feels wasteful. Um, and I have to be careful because people at this point would probably pu uh, publish my own notes at this point. And I don't want to do that. Tolkien wanted them to burn the Cimmerillion. He wanted to destroy it, not published. That's my understanding. I would haunt them. <laughs> if I tell people to burn something and not publish it, and they publish it, I'll come back. <laughs> you know, I'll just be sitting there going, really? And I think my friends believe me. <laughs> OK, other questions? Um, sure. <laughs> yes. Well, no one really inspires me to be better now. 
I'm just that good. <laughs> but before I understood my own voice and had my own voice, um, uh, one of my earliest influences uh, was Louisa May Alcott because she was the first wo woman writer I knew that made a living at it. And she wasn't an old dead white guy. Um, and I used to try to write that kind of story, actually, which was sad because it's not my forte. I would try to write like little women stories. And um, then I read at 14, I found uh, Pigeons from Hell by Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan. I'd never read fantasy or horror, dark fantasy or heroic fantasy or, I'd never read any of it. And this was a revelation to me. I knew not only did I want to be a writer, but I wanted to write this. And after that, I found Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. Andre Norton was another woman who actually seemed real to me, because in the back of one of the books, it said she had to leave college because she was allergic to things, and she was ill, and she seemed like a real person. And I thought maybe a 14-year-old girl from the middle of farm country can actually make this, make this work, do this for a living. Um, Salem's Lot by Stephen King was probably went into the hopper and helped me want to put vampires in the modern day. Um, these are all things I read as teenagers. Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire. I read Interview with the Vampire and Salem's Lot the same year, or within a year of each other. And I think that was really, that really shows in how I viewed them or how I wanted to do vampires later on. Um, Robert B. Parker was how I learned to do dialogue. Robert B. Parker's Spencer series. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. That's how I learned to do dialogue. Because as a writer, when I was a teenager, I would decide what I was bad at. And then I would try to do it. Um, I couldn't do a decent fight scene, so I decided to write heroic fantasy, which is all fight scenes. And then I realized I couldn't do decent dialogue, so I decided to write a series that was mostly hard-boiled detective fiction, which is Anita, which is almost all dialogue. And then I realized I couldn't do a decent kiss on paper, and that got out of hand. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and E.B. White, Charlotte's Web, was the first book that, that I looked at and I understood how writing worked. I didn't understand how to do it, but I looked at that and thought, that's good writing, and I was right. So all of that, all that has inspired and helped. Um, I read Tolkien Too Late. I read, I read Tolkien Too Late to have it go in and, and, and affect me as much as it might have. I read mostly um, heroic fantasy rather than high fantasy. I'd be a different writer maybe if I'd read it earlier. All right, other questions? Yes, in the black t-shirt, yes. So when you were first starting out as a professional writer, when it came to your writing, what was your biggest challenge and how did you tackle it? When I started out as a professional writer, what was my biggest challenge? Um, do you mean after? A professional writer to me means I've sold. Is that what you mean? Okay, the first hurdle as a beginning writer is, have you written a book? <laughs> I, I'm, no, I'm serious, I get this a lot. And I ask people, have you written it? They're already worried about selling the book, they're already worried about marketing, they're already worried about will they get a movie deal? And I go, have you finished a book? No. Finish a book. That seems simple. It's very hard to do, but it seems self-explanatory. You have to have something to market, you have to have finished, you have to be good enough with writing, which means you have to put your butt in a chair and write. And you have to write on a regular basis, and then you have to edit what you write, but don't edit it to death, edit just enough. Send it out to markets that will pay you. Don't give your work away, okay? to take your tonsils out. <laughs> Writers are supposed to get paid. Now, if you've tried every other venue and you can't, publish, publish all you want. Publish, you know, publish, put it out on the internet, there you go. But what I'm running into is a lot of writers say they couldn't take the rejection so they didn't go the traditional route. I ask them how many times have they been rejected? And they say two or five. Seriously, the most has been five rejections. 
pleasures alone was rejected over 200 times. Over 200 rejection slips, officially, for guilty pleasures alone of my work. If I had felt like everybody else, Anita wouldn't be here today, because I wouldn't have been able to afford to keep writing it. I'd have had to do something else. Don't give up on yourself. And rejection isn't permanent. Rejection isn't permanent. Your writing isn't rejected by everybody because one person doesn't like it, or two people don't, or five people don't. There's out there somebody that's gonna love your stuff. Just keep sending it out, and you write something else while it's out there selling. Because if you have only one baby out in the world, you're like a parent with one child that's overly protective. That's all you think about. If you have multiple children, then you're too busy to worry <laughs> as much. So write and actually try to make a living. If, if you want to make a living at it, now if all you want is your stories out there, the internet is there. But if you actually want to try to make a living at it, a good living at it, then you have to take the rejection because it's gonna come. It's, this is a sad business as far as, if you can't take rejection, you have to do something else because this is a harsh business. It's better than acting. You get, you get rejected in person there. Um, I mean, any of the arts is hard. Uh, being in a band is hard. Being in front of an audience is hard. You can, comics go up on stage every night and face an audience that can hate them and reject them in person. At least you're distanced by the writing and they just reject your writing, not look it in your eyes. Though, I did have an editor call me on Thanksgiving once and it was the first time I cooked for my in-laws. This is back in the day with my first marriage. And I had the big turkey going, I got the editor calling for the anthology I had sent in, and I thought he would, he would not call on Thanksgiving to reject me, so I'm gonna get my first story acceptance with, with my in-laws here. This rocks! He rejected me over the phone. And I remember looking at the phone going, you called on Thanksgiving for this. Sadist much? <laughs> And then he went on to explain that he loved my story, loved it, and wanted it in his anthology, but it didn't work with the theme because my zombies had a reason to rise from the grave, and this was only about zombies that didn't. And I said, excuse me? It's a zombie anthology. Yes, but it has to be like Night of the Living Dead, so you don't know why the zombies rose. I said, okay. He says, I'll send you my other anthology, you read it over, make the changes I want, and I'll buy it. He said, my, the story, uh, the anthology, I looked it over, and it was a grotesquery anthology. Do you know what I mean by grotesqueries? Just icky. Two, I read two of the stories that made me just go, I now feel I need a shower, and not in a good way. Um, I decided I, didn't, I wasn't going to make his, the changes he wanted. That was the Anita story, Those Who Seek Forgiveness, which would finally see print in uh, my own anthology, Strange Candy. I get the best rejection slips on, straight, on that story. Editors loved it, but didn't want to publish it. I actually had one magazine that rejected it because I wasn't a big enough name. And I wouldn't make them enough money with my name on the cover. And I am petty. So when I got to be a big enough name and they invited me to send a story to the same publication, I refused. <laughs> Politely. But if you don't want me when I need you, but you only want me when you need me, you're not my friend. <laughs> All right, other questions? Uh, I'm trying to think. Okay, if I call on you and you've already asked a question, remind me because I'm starting to get a little bit crowd-dazed, okay? <laughs> Lavender shirt in the back. Are we gonna see more of Mary? I think so. Because um, I've already got, well, I don't know about Mary, but Mary's world. Because I've got two story ideas that have been talking to me of people who didn't get on stage. Barinthus is, it may be from Barinthus's point of view. Yeah, really? I know, weird, isn't it? Um, and I've got another story, I've got a couple of stories of minor characters telling their story. Reese is beginning to be, maybe, maybe, he might get his own. <laughs> Mary is kind of content, the, but, but, okay, 
this was such a hard book to write, and it broke my heart. And I thought, I'll never have to write it again, just finish it. And then, son of a bitch. I realized that I'd written the first lines of another book. Uh, and it was Mary's book, and I went, no, not so soon. I'm, st I'm still, I'm still not, my office still looks like a disaster area from this book, please, not yet. And so I've got a sticky note. A Sugar Light, the title, has been a sticky note in my wall for over a decade. It was one of the titles I came up with for Mary in the original progression of the titles. And when we were looking for a title, I said, wait, I have an idea. <laughs> and I read it, and my editor loved it, and everybody else did too. So it waited over a decade for that title to get used. Oh, and by the way, Swallowing Darkness, it was six weeks of me not understanding why every time I said that title as a suggestion, my editor giggled. <laughs> I swear to you, my hand to God and Goddess, I swear to you, I didn't understand that this was a double entendre. I just thought it was a cool title. And, and I didn't get it. It took six weeks of my editor giggling like a seventh grader for me to, to for, if her to finally tell me why she was giggling and me go, explained to me what she thought I was making a joke and I wasn't I was totally sincere and so I still think it's a pretty title and it doesn't have to be a double entendre unless you think it is and most people thought it was but Yes, we've been friends for you know a couple of decades, so yes, he understands that I'm perfectly capable of coming up with a great double entendre and not getting it at all. It's one of the things that my friends value about me, that I never get jaded. It's always a surprise. I'm cynical, but not jaded. All right, other questions? Yes. I don't have a favorite between Darkness and Frost. If I had a favorite, we'd have chosen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mo I I'm polyamorous. If I could pick, I would. <laughs> but if I don't have to, why should I? <laughs> All right. Uh, red hair. How do my characters come to me, or how do I, I, I kind of said how I make them in, the, I find their voice by writing hundreds of wasted pages that aren't wasted. But how do my characters come to me? Characters come in different ways. Jean-Claude wasn't coming on stage because I wanted him to be Spanish. Because at the time, I spoke Spanish. Do not speak Spanish to me now. It has been over 20 years. My Spanish is really bad. My sister is very disappointed in me. Um, I spoke Spanish. I could read Spanish. I had a good accent in Spanish. And he wanted to be French. And I thought, that's such a cliche. And he says, well, no, not really. It's just Anne Rice that did French. And, you know, I started thinking about it. And really, it really was Anne Rice that pretty much put forward the French, that most of the vampires are French. It was really that that kind of solidified it. You just assume everyone's French after that. Um, and Sheridan La Fanu did Carmilla, which was one of the earliest vampire stories and very influential on me when I was beginning to think about it, more so than Dracula, actually. Um, so he insisted he was French. And I said, but I don't speak French, and I don't read French, and I don't know anything about French grammar. And he says, I'm French. <laughs> and once I let him be French, he stepped on stage in his clothes. <laughs> And he was Jean Claude. And he was French. And let me just apologize to French speaking people everywhere for the early French in my books. Because the friend who was helping me said she had more knowledge of French than she actually did. And since I had none, 
there's some there's a one sentence that makes me cringe in the first book I believe either guilty pleasures or laughing course I just sit there and go and every time it gets translated or retranslated my French publisher calls or the translator calls and goes what does this even mean <laughs> and I'm going I no longer remember what I'm even <laughs> aiming at um, and went to Paris French publisher brought, brought me in Jonathan came with me we're in Paris it's romantic it's wonderful no one parties down like the French publishers. No one wines and dines you like the French. They had wine and all the things, great wine. Too bad I don't drink that much. Um, and, uh, but at one of the last parties, my French translator, who'd been very wonderful to me the whole time, I said, I will learn to speak French before I come back next time. And she says, you can try, but you will fail. is really bad. I, I pronounce French like a British peasant, <laughs> I've been told. And then I was told that if I, they really hated my accent, they'd say I speak it like an American peasant. <laughs> now, if you go, to, we love the Parisians though, because I tried to speak French everywhere I went. Badly, but I tried. And if you try to speak French, they'll forgive you. They'll, they'll like you. They'll, they'll kind of giggle at your French, but they will be absolutely polite if you try to speak their language first. So if you go there, and in Rome, in Italy, your most important phrase is scuse, scuse, because you're invisible in the shops till you say it. If you speak English in the Vatican, in the gift shop in the Vatican, you're not there, not there. We had this group of American tourists ahead of us, and they were like talking English, and the shopkeepers, they weren't there. And I went, scuse, scuse, and they went, yes. And I went, they need help. <laughs> and then they helped them, and then I explained to them a few phrases that would help them survive. Um, no one tries to speak their native language across the world as hard as Americans do. It's embarrassing. We don't even try. Other countries may dress worse. <laughs> Come on. Crocs? Really? <laughs> I saw people wearing Crocs in freaking Paris. It, was make, it just made me go, Crocs are heinous anyway. They're comfortable, but do you know though, doctors said that when the Crocs were at their biggest, they had more foot and ankle injuries than they ever seen. So they were comfortable, but they weren't supportive. And I'm just going, I am embarrassed for my countrymen because you're wearing Crocs in Paris. Paris! Paris! They were dressing better than us before our country existed. Hold up your end! Better than this. Tennis shoes, I'm okay with that. Trainers, I'm okay with that. Combat boots, I don't care. Not Crocs. Anyway. All right, other questions? Yes, in the, okay, you're both wearing black. Uh, blue skirt. Okay. I don't see how, I don't, Peter Edwards soon to be stepson legally, but already stepson in every other way. I think he's gonna to try to go into the family business. I don't know how that's gonna work out. Anita and I are a little worried about him. Um, one of the reasons he hasn't been on stage again is because we'd like him to at least be legal to die for his country before we hurt him again. Because he gets cut up every time he gets on stage. I'm really worried about him. I'm really worried about what's going to happen. But I do know that the next time we see him will be the wedding. And that will be more fun because he's going to be the best man. He's going to be, she's standing up with Edward, but I don't know if he's the best man. I think, I think Edward's going to make Peter the best man and then Nita's going to be like a uh, groomsman person. Grooms person. Um, so we are going to get to see the wedding and then Peter will be on stage. And I think the biggest problem Peter's going to have is if he finds out about Cedric. 
because he's seen Anita as untouchable, she's too old, she's, she's just the crush, but if she's dating someone who's almost his age, that gets a little weird, and that may bother him, so we'll probably have those awkward conversations. <laughs> Why not me? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to explain this to you. I don't owe you this explanation. There! Therapy. <laughs> all right. Um, yes, I, all right. I had only shot two guns in my entire life. One gun when I first started researching for Anita. So I learned to enjoy handguns through the research for the books. And I find that my imagination goes ahead of me in real life. So now I have my own little arsenal. And um, I'm working, I, I'm trying to go, my goal is to have my husband and I, for me to be comfortable enough. Because he's, he didn't know, he knew less about guns than I did. And my interest in them has made him just go whole hog. He is uh, looking at, he's, he's good enough to be a gunsmith. I mean, he just loves how, he, how it works. Um, my goal is for us to be able to do the, the partner's training at one of the, the schools so that we can go through the live fire exercise and be partners, literally have each other's back. I have to be comfortable before we get to do that. That's going to be a while. But that's my goal. Um, but no, uh, most of the things, uh, Anita, I was doing, I researched the BDSM for Anita for the books before I knew I had an interest in it. I researched guns first. I researched Wiccan and uh, Faith before, uh, for Mary, before I was, became Wiccan. So my imagination is always ahead of me. Sometimes that frightens me now, now that I know I do that, because I'm going, I don't want some of this in my life. And then others of it, we go, I wonder how it will manifest, for real. All right. Other questions? I'm trying to see if I'm seeing everybody. Ah, yes! I have been approached once upon a time, a few years back, for a series. Actually, Charlene Harris and I, who are friends, we signed about the same time. But her series went ahead and got made, mine did not, because Hollywood, as Neil Gaiman said so eloquently, makes many more contracts than it makes movies. So, I've been approached, we did the deal, I was even, we were even beginning to look at casting when it just fell apart for various reasons. I don't know if we'll do it or not, to be honest. Um, certainly now we could probably do the content. When we were first being approached, the, a lot of the barriers hadn't been crossed. Now, thanks to HBO and Skinamax, <laughs> the sky's the limit. By the way, just as, an, just as a person, just as a, P, a PSA, is a PSA? But, yes, as a PSA, please do not get your sex from porn. Because if you look at interviews with actresses and actors who actually do porn, and then you interview them about their real sex lives, which, you know, I'm always looking for other people's misspent youth, so I don't have to. Um, they say that a lot of the stuff they do on screen, they don't want to do in real life, but they get paid more money for it. So if you're looking at porn and thinking that's really what you should be getting, not so much. If the actresses really doing it are not wanting to do it off screen in their real life, probably you're going with the expectation that's going to happen here in real life, maybe not so good. And do not use softcore porn for sex, because the whole idea is that they get to look like they're having sex, but they don't be having sex. So a lot of those positions actually won't work. <laughs> so it's not that you're not limber. It's not that you can't do the Karma Sutra. That's not why you can't do some of the soft core porn sex. It's not real sex. So nobody gets to do it. <laughs> so just thought I'd add that. Because as I researched, as I researched that and realized how, how it's designed to look good on camera, but not be really good sex in real life, I mean, boy, most people don't know that. So, and thanks to the internet, more and more people are using the internet to go, that's what I want. What if it's not real? <laughs> and don't even get me started by how much people use technology to make everything look perfect. Yeah, they can do that digitally now. It's not just magazines now. 
They can do digital enhancement on actual moving pictures. So how real is it? So don't compare yourself to what you're seeing on the screen. It's not real. They're not even enjoying it as much as you think they are. They're paid to look like that. I'm sorry. If you're not being messy, if you're not at the end of it looking with your hair up to here and just you look like you did a marathon, that's good sex. Sex is like working out at the gym. If you still look pretty at the end of it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> All right, other questions? I think you asked a question, did I? You, okay, 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 yes. Um, I won't make you arm wrestle, it occurred to me, but <laughs> she can yeah. okay, yes. All right, so how are you built on Anita being a marshal? I used to develop a little bit over time, but how are you gonna continue with that? How are you how is it gonna grow? Um, I don't know. How neat is the Marshall's going to grow? I know that the preternatural branch of the Marshall Service is going to eventually be hived off into its own organization, and that's gonna go horribly pear-shaped. And it is said on stage that it's really their assassins with badges, which is not at all what the Marshall Service is. One of the reasons I did the Marshall Service is it's the easiest, in some ways, it's the most welcoming to you if you want to get into the branch. And the Marshall Service actually had the first women, had some of the first women going back in their service, which I thought was really cool and impressive. And um, so if you're already an officer, already a police officer of so many years, then you can get into the marshal service, depending on other things. But the preternatural branch, this was the easiest for them to attach it to an actual unit, an actual badge. They crossed all sorts of lines to make the preternatural branch. It is not a good idea to give this much power to people who can kill you and hunt you down and kill you. It's not. And it's going to go horribly pear-shaped. We'll be seeing that. So not so much growing as a marshal, so much as watching the Marshall branch of the Preternatural Service change. I do have a book idea with Anita just going off and being a Marshall, being the only Marshall in the area. Because if you're a U.S. Marshall and another U.S. Marshall in the area calls for aid and you're the closest person, you need to go do that. I just like the idea of her doing a non-Preternatural crime. I think that would be interesting to have no monsters or zombies or anybody involved and just have her go and and act in a crime that is actually not her forte. I don't know. It'd be very interesting to me. So I'm making notes. We may actually do that and have a whole mystery that is actually just real people doing horrible things, which everything in my books that is not done with my magic system is a real crime. Everything that's ever happened in any of my books to a human being that didn't need my magic system to work is a real crime based on something that somebody actually did to somebody else. Think about that. I don't need to make up bad stuff. Real people do it all the time. All right. Last question. Last, que last question? Last question. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> do you, I didn't know it was the last question. Oh, if you need to, if you, if okay. You want. But you were very nice and let her go first, so, <laughs> so I will. So, oh, you mean a serious TV deal? I'm thinking I have a serious deal. It's a serious book deal. Um, TV or movie? TV or movie. Um, I don't know because I uh, have done comic book scripts. Now, uh, Jonathan and I did a uh, prequel to Guilty Pleasures called First Death, and we are contracted to do an original uh, Edward graphic novel. Yes, that's cool. So I can do I can do original script and original dialogue in my world, but it is a different medium. Comics are different from books and movies are different again because one of the interesting things that you have to remember when you're taking a book to screen is that you have a book that's maybe, oh I don't know, four hundred thousand pages long. A movie script, on the other hand, is about 120 pages long. So you take a 600, 800 page novel and you cut it down to 120 pages and you see how much you can save. 
See, it's a really different medium. It's a really different time constraint. So um, it's, an, it's a different art form. So I could do original script, but I would want somebody to help me adapt if we were taking the books to that, because I wouldn't know how to cut it that severely and keep everything. Okay, one more question, because I didn't know we were almost out. So pressure on you for this one. So yes. More reptile lycanthropes. I have actually, um, but the snakes get big enough anyway, <laughs> and um, there aren't as many reptilian lycanthropes across the world as there are mammalian, and I don't know why, because they eat you, and almost all lycanthropes are, are predators that can eat you. Um, so. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm having trouble finding enough legends to back it up for wear snakes. I'm, I can have, there are wizards that changed into snakes. There are deities that changed into snakes. There are deities that controlled snakes. So, and crocodilians, everything. But actual people that changed into them rather than use their forms for things is a different thing and it's, and it's not the same. So I'm having trouble finding mythology to back it up. There are reptilian creatures that people changed into, but they aren't reptiles if you read the details. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm overthinking it, but that's what I do.